Royal weddings are steeped in tradition, grand affairs that combine royalty, tradition, and old world values. Well, that's all about to change because Prince Harry dances to his own tune. Prince Charles to his son, Prince William, each chose the perfect British princess. Prince Harry took a different route in a very confident, independent, and drop down gorgeous American named Meghan Markle. All very excited, um, delighted for the boat. William and I are absolutely thrilled. Uh, it's such exciting news. Well, the Queen's happy about it. Uh, if she wasn't happy, she wouldn't have given her permission. This relationship with Meghan Markle was going to go all the way to the altar. We look at Prince Harry and Meghan and how they came together in a whirlwind romance. It's not about protocol, it's not about the family, it's about the two people who are in love. It's just always nice when someone who seems really cool falls in love and gets engaged. Super excited for her. Just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. <laughs> Through expert opinion, we show you preparations from the royal venue to the cake and everything in between. We will also examine past royal weddings and how they compare to Harry and Meghan's. We will also celebrate the big day and discuss the future for this fairy tale matchup. Meghan may not be from the proper bloodlines, but no matter, she has won over the British public and captured the heart of a prince. When news of Prince Harry's new love, actress Meghan Markle hit the internet, it rocked royal foundations and sent the press into a tailspin. This relationship with Meghan Markle was going to go all the way to the altar, that they had never seen Harry so in love, um, so head turned, and actually so happy. In the absence of any denials from Kensington Palace or royal insiders, the world knew that the bachelor prince was serious about his new love. It's an incredible love story, isn't it? Uh, an American actress meets Prince Charming. An onslaught of questions began to form about the romance. Where did they meet? How long? And most important, who is Miss Markle? Megan grew up in a family with not a lot of money. Her parents separated when she was six years old. Megan is one of our own. You know, she started as kind of a real girl from Los Angeles. Megan Markle is a very special, engaging woman. She's extremely clever. She's very sincere and very eloquent. And I think she's one of those people who everybody, when they meet her, falls in love with. Markle, a successful actress and philanthropist in her own right, had no problem dealing with the intense speculation regarding her romance. Meghan Markle is going to be a bigger interest factor than, than William's wife, Kate, because of the, the, the connection, because of the American uh, connection, because of the fact of the divorce and the, and the sort of this sort of film star, which generates so much interest. This is somebody who has been an actress for many years and who has become quite a big star and also, you know, potentially could have become a really big Hollywood star. As the romance grew from strength to strength, the engagement announcement in November of 2017 was not surprising and celebrated worldwide. Not only was everyone excited about new blood being pumped into the royal family, but that the lovable prince who struggled through years of emotional hardship had finally found a home for his heart. Once labeled the wild royal, Prince Harry was born and raised under the intense scrutiny of global media. I remember the very first day that I went to Sandringham House in Norfolk, which is one of the Queen's palaces. In, and I remember sort of walking and being shown into this white room, this royal room at, in Sandringham by a very attentive butler. And uh, he said, oh, it's Inspector Wharf, man, from London. Oh, she said, Ken, I don't envy you looking after my children. They can be a bloody nuisance. At which point, Harry was destamonizing this vase of royal lilies on a small table. 
And uh, William was attempting to play the piano. And William turned around and said, no, no, I'm no, we're not, are we, Harry? And he sort of burbled something as a three-year-old, fell off this table, followed by this vase of lilies that crashed on the floor. Of course, they get up and run like any kids do. And Diane says, come here, both of you, come here, and runs out of the room. And I hadn't said a word. He performed his first royal duties as a small child and nearly drowned in scandal as a young adult, all before witnessing the atrocities of war in an active combat role while serving in the British Army. I remember him as a, as a, as a three-year-old. He was never out of khaki uniforms. This guy was a soldier in waiting. And luckily, he had every encouragement from his father and his mother. I got here on Christmas Eve. Most of the guys were pretty bummed that I was here because nothing was happening for the first few days that I was here. But things are picking up again. But he achieved that. He went to the military academy at Sandhurst. He sort of fought his battle in Afghanistan. But of course, he realized that this wasn't an army life forever. Because of the risks involved, you know, he himself had to be protected in Afghanistan. And he realized that after the first tour and the second tour, he couldn't really justify that. And the only thing that let him down was the fact that he was a member of the royal family. But there is no doubt that the singular, most painful event in the young prince's life was his mother's death in 1997. The world watched Harry, age 12, walk behind his mother's coffin as the funeral procession wove through London to Westminster Abbey. A lot of people hold Harry in particular affection actually around the world. They remember that image of Harry walking behind his mother's coffin. Prince Harry, now an activist for mental health, revealed that decades of chaos followed this life-altering loss. Harry has come from a broken home. Harry has uh, he's admitted to having mental health issues. Uh, having to come to terms with the death of his mother. It actually took him 20 years to admit that he did have these mental health issues and he did something about it. He stumbled publicly and the world got to see it all. The Nazi costume worn to a fancy dress party, the racial nicknames doled out to fellow Sandhurst cadets, and strip billards in Las Vegas with nude photos to boot. Harry has grown up a lot in the last few years if we remember the kind of celebrity kind of lifestyle he was living and those some of those parties he was going to and those pictures of him that were you know less than desirable as far as the queen was concerned we've seen harry struggle throughout the years you know whether it's through acting out with drugs or other things harry acted out as most young adults do except his mistakes were public he's been sort of a typical teenage boy a typical young 20 something boy but he's had to do it in the public eye on the world stage even apologies were critiqued and judged beyond the paparazzi noise it became clear that this was not a usual teenage rebellion harry was suffering Harry, in every sense of the word, is a carbon copy um, of his mother in so many ways. Um, you know, he has that sort of risk element attached to his life. Uh, he likes a joke, he gets things wrong, you know, but he learns from his mistakes. You know, I know people have given him a bit of a kicking in the past with the things that, that have, in, in some people's words, brought discredit on the royal family, but he's learned from his mistakes. And in that sense, you know, that gives him that normality a word that Diana was using often, you know, I, I just want my kids to be normal. I want to be normal. Who knows what, what, the, what, the, uh, what the situation would be, or what the world would be like if she was still around. So, no, there's, there's all sorts of thoughts and, uh, and, uh, and emotions that, that, that come running through, especially the fact that I was here last in 1993, running around with, you know, Donald Duck and, and all, that, all those characters with her. And now I'm back here, you know, 31 years old, and, uh, and, you know, try, and, try my best to, to make her proud. Harry's transformation has been actually a remarkable one because um, we've seen his life take really many different paths. We've seen him get into trouble for underage drinking, for smoking cannabis, for dressing up as a Nazi at a friend's birthday party, you know, for ending up without any clothes on more recently in Vegas. Um, and each time these things happen, the public, I think, forgive Harry, and I think they probably forgive him because he's got a place in all of our hearts. I don't think anyone will ever forget that 
very, very striking and, and heartfelt image of him walking behind his mother's coffin. He was 12 years old when he lost his mother. Prince Harry found inspiration for change through the unconditional support of his brother, Prince William, who gave Harry a hearty dose of the candid honesty he needed. Amidst the turmoil of grief, adolescence, and life as a royal, the influence of Diana's passion for humanitarian work, and specifically HIV, remained with Harry. After visiting Lesotho in his gap year, Harry and Prince Seso of Lesotho formed the Sintabali organization in 2016. And the charity started in 2006, and it was started by Prince Harry and also Prince Seso of Lesotho. And it followed a, a visit that Harry made in 2004. He spent a couple of months up in the mountains in Lesotho. It's a very remote area. Um, and he was really struck by, particularly by the plight of the children there. So there are so many vulnerable children in the Sutu, it's a very poor country, and it has been affected very seriously by the HIV AIDS epidemic. So one in three children are orphaned as a result of the epidemic. It's behind the scenes up in the mountains where you know, you're, the sort of volunteer nurses are doing sort of house runs to go and basically help these you know, really sick people, not just kids, but sort of elderly people as well, who are dying of AIDS, lying in their beds with, with no access to a hospital, no access to a clinic. Sintabali means forget me not in Lesotho's and was the word deliberately chosen to represent both princes' late mothers. The work that we do in Lesotho and Botswana and soon Malawi is to provide a safe space for children who are living with HIV to be able to learn more about living with HIV, be able to build confidence and, and resilience about how they stay healthy. Why Lesotho was because he was there um, and obviously he, he saw and witnessed himself the, the situation that, that some of the young people were in and so he was just responded to that. But obviously it does stem from interest in support in following on. His mother started in terms of um, breaking down stigma around HIV. I asked friends of mine choosing where I should go for my gap year and it was it was sort of based around what my mother had been doing and I wanted to sort of carry that on um, and what better place than to do it here. It's got a problem with AIDS and there's lots of children. I'm so sure she knew this place but you know, we decided trying to start something slightly new. Carrying the torch for his mother, the People's Princess. Humanitarian work is critical in Prince Harry's role as a royal. Prince Harry's been very, very involved and very actively involved in the charity from the very beginning, from the very start. He regularly attends board meetings. He has to sign off the strategy. In addition to that, he loves being out in the field. And the reason for that, really, he's got a real genuine empathy with young people, with kids. Um, they really kind of are massively attracted to him. We've seen him with his uh nephew and niece. We've seen him with children, whether it's at Centre Bali and Lesotho. We've seen him with children in hospital. We've seen him in nursery schools. We've seen him at schools. Uh, we've seen him with people at the Invictus Games. Harry is a people person, but there is something lacking in his life. Harry's mischievous nature has always won hearts, even while struggling on the inside. The prince's rugged good looks and charming ways attracted potential suitors. Chelsea Davy was one such lady and became Prince Harry's on and off girlfriend from 2004 to 2011. Chelsea Davy was a long term, but that fizzled out. I don't think Chelsea Davy was prepared to go into the goldfish bowl. Sometimes the timing just isn't right and this relationship was not to be. In 2012, his casual dating came to a halt again when his cousin, Princess Eugenie, introduced him to Cressida Bonus. He was an actor. Uh, she didn't want to. She wanted to pursue an acting career. This relationship ended in 2014 when royal public life became too much for Cressida. There were points when I think most people thought that the relationship might end with an engagement, but actually neither of those girlfriends wanted the intense spotlight that comes with being a royal girlfriend. They didn't want that level of, of intrusion in their lives, and ultimately they weren't prepared to make the sacrifice that they needed to make to be with Prince Harry. Through ups and downs, Harry has been able to find himself, and now his soulmate. In 2016, when a friend in Toronto introduced Meghan Markle to a prince, perhaps in some way the universe knew it was time.
I didn't know much about him, and so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was, I had one question, I said, well, is he nice? Already a successful actress and well-known humanitarian, 36-year-old Meghan Markle is accustomed to living in the spotlight. But in November 2017, her engagement to Prince Harry triggered an escalation of media attention that the royal-to-be had probably never experienced before. It's the stuff of fairy tales, another fantastical royal wedding to inspire a nation. But sadly, the joy of this pending union has been splintered by the worst of those in the media since the news of their courtship broke. The difficulty, of course, with, with Prince Harry finding love with a famous actress was exactly that. She was a famous actress. At the time that the romance was actually revealed in the papers, I remember she was promoting a clothing line for Reitman's, the Canadian department store, and she was having to do a lot of press around that. Well, how could you do press interviews around a clothing line and people not want to talk about Prince Harry? So I think they realised early on, particularly at the palace, that there was a potential conflict of interest. It's why we saw her posting less on Instagram. Uh, it's why we saw her eventually close down her lifestyle blog and eventually give up her career as an actress, which is what she's done to marry Harry. She's going to have to be very careful about what goes on social media now. I mean, it's a royal rule of thumb that there's no selfies. And we saw that in her first day out in Nottingham when she was taking photos with people. She was like, no, I'm not allowed, no selfies. Markle is a biracial American, an actress and a divorcee. And while most people find this union a beautiful and refreshing reflection on what the 21st century should reflect, it made Markle an immediate target for the dark media who were quick to release bigoted, racially charged slurs. There's a misconception that because I have worked in the entertainment industry that this would be something I would be familiar with. But even though I'd been on my show for, I guess, six years at that point, and working before that, I've never been part of tabloid culture. I've never been in pop culture. You know, Megan certainly felt that the British press were out to get her. I don't think the press were out to get her as such. I think they were out to find out as much as they could about her. You know, her ex-husband being doorstepped, her mother having reporters turning up asking questions, all of her friends being contacted. I haven't met him, but... Um... I mean, I've spoken to Meg a couple of times. They're so happy and so in love and it's so normal. And it's not a nice experience. It's one that Harry has spoken about and has always recognised. It's the one experience that immediately puts a potential girlfriend off. And of course, it would do. That line between public and private life is, 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 is almost uh, non-existent anymore. And we, we will continue to do our best to ensure that, that, that there is the line. I tried to warn you as much as possible, mm -hmm. but I think both of us were totally surprised by the, the reaction. Internet trolls pounced, and a media storm of sexist and bigoted articles were released. This appalling lack of decency made it impossible not to ponder the similarities between Meghan and Harry's late mother. Diana, Princess of Wales, who was the subject of such intense media scrutiny that most believe the paparazzi caused her tragic death. And those people that, that caused the accident, instead of helping with taking photographs of, of her dying on the back seat. And then those photographs made, made their way back to, uh, to news desks in this country. This was all pre-social media. You know, the, the genuine paparazzis were the guys with a camera around their neck um, and the sort of Fleet Street mob, you know, the national newspapers. Now we've got this extraordinary social media where everybody with, with, a, with a smartphone is a, is a potential paparazzi. I think I can very safely say, as naive as it sounds now, mm -hmm. having gone through this learning curve in the past year and a half, I did not have any understanding of just what it would be like. Nowadays, it's, it's not just the TV we'll be watching. We'll be watching people's social media. We'll be going onto their Instagrams and going onto their Twitter and their Snapchats and their Facebooks to see what their opinion is. You know, it's not just about it. in the olden days, you know, in Diana time, you know, before then, you would have a royal correspondent or a fashion expert just saying their opinion. Now you have millions of people's opinions. Not so long ago, Kate Middleton endured similar scrutiny and had to take legal action to protect herself. But this is 2018, 
Miss Markle is engaged to a man who sadly knows too well the damage an obsessive media can inflict. I think that Harry's probably being pretty cool throughout this whole ride. He's experienced that sort of back and forth of not totally being ready for this royal family and the living under the microscope in the way that he has had to. And I think he's probably been a really great coach and mentor for Meghan through this to kind of prepare her for what she's about to experience. It's not just, of course, her career. In terms of what Meghan is going to have to learn, um, she's going to have to learn who her friends are. She's going to have to learn who she can trust. She's going to have to get used to having a protection officer 24-7. She's going to have to get used to everything in her life absolutely everything from what she wears, to who she's seen with, to where she goes for her facials, to being photographed absolutely everywhere in every situation. I think you can, you can have as many conversations as you want and try and prepare as much as possible, but we were, we were totally un unprepared for, for what happened after that. It's funny because Harry can relate to that. When he was bad boy Harry, you know, three, four years ago, he started up a fake Facebook account. He was Spike Wells, and that's how he met these girls in Vegas. And, you know, the palace had to shut that down. This time, Buckingham Palace's response was direct and swift when it came to the defense of Meghan Markle. They called out the dark media and put a swift end to their trolling. However, with Meghan having experience in Hollywood, this sort of scrutiny was an everyday occurrence for her. Not only could she handle negative comments on various social sites, but she was a pro with the paparazzi and media. I think the reaction to Meghan is getting better in the press. I think it was ugly to begin with. I think the press in the UK really, really went hard on her. And Meghan pointed that out in her interview that she had with Harry. She said, you know, I don't even read it anymore. I think we were just hit so hard at the beginning with a lot of mistruths that I made the choice to not read anything, positive or negative. I think Meghan is used to tabloid spreads. I think the fact of the matter is she has modeled. She has been an up and coming actress who did very well. She's done probably some things that she regrets in the past. She's been married for, for one, you know, which is a big story. She's been, she's divorced. The headlines have already been out there for her. So I don't think really anything can faze her. We think that Meghan, soon to be the Duchess of Sussex, has far more to offer the royal family than the critics are crying about. I think you're going to see with Meghan a bit of magic, I think, to the royal family, that sprinkling of stardust. Meghan Markle is the epitome of a true Californian, born and raised by her Emmy Award winning father and her mother, a social worker and yoga instructor. Meghan grew up in a family with not a lot of money. Her parents separated when she was six years old. Her dad actually won the lottery when she was nine for 750,000 US dollars, which allowed Meghan to go to Northwestern School just outside Chicago, which is an amazing university. Had that not happened, she would have never had that opportunity. But I bet you, Megan still would have been where she is today had she not gone to that university. Megan is one of our own. You know, she started as kind of a real girl from Los Angeles. Um, she went to Northwestern where she majored in theater and international relations. And then obviously she became a TV star, but she was still fairly below the radar for people that didn't watch Suits. So with Megan, there is this sense of a real girl just like us married into the royal family and ascended to this lofty position. Her heritage and a relatively privileged West Coast life seem to have given Meghan a unique lens through which she navigates the world. It's plain to see that she's worked tirelessly to carve out an incredible successful career with grace and elegance long before meeting her prince. There's also no need for concern by the royal establishment over Meghan's stamina for work. Her resume makes us wonder where she gets her energy. Working as a calligrapher to make ends meet while auditioning tirelessly alongside thousands of other acting hopefuls in LA and playing smaller roles for years. Meghan's tenacity paid off when she landed the role of Rachel Zane in Suits in 2011. There's a long list of things that don't qualify her to be a royal bride. But the truth is, if you delve a little bit deeper into who Meghan is and the roles that she's had in the past, she actually is quite a solid fit for Harry. 
And I think that the fact that she was an actress on a hit TV show has taught her a lot and will prepare her for this role. Miss Markle has never been the girl in the corner either. When it comes to fighting for the right causes, at the tender age of 11, she fought for and won a battle against a national company to change its sexist material. It's about one out of every three commercials is gonna say something that's gonna hurt somebody's feeling. And her willingness to work freely for humanitarian causes was well documented long before meeting her prince. I am proud to be a woman and a feminist. A relentless advocate for women's rights, Markle has campaigned on this issue with the United Nations since 2015. Women need a seat at the table. They need an invitation to be seated there. And in some cases where this isn't available, well, then you know what? Then they need to create their own table. Megan's an ambassador for World Vision Canada. We saw her go to Rwanda on a water mission. And I think that those are things that Megan loves and is passionate about. And she was really interested in those things before even having met Harry or thought up this idea of becoming a princess. So I think that that says a lot, is that this is genuinely something that's in her and not that she's playing it to be. I work with Megan on a thing called the Global Gift Gala, which is a big event that we do in London to raise awareness for many different charities. The charity we work with was called Caldwell Children, which is for disabled children. Megan hosted it and she got very involved in what we did and she wanted to learn about the charity. She wanted to learn about how we benefit the children. It appears that Megan will fit right into life as a royal and bringing her grace, poise, and proven work ethic and a seemingly inherent desire to help others. Both of us have passions for, 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 for wanting to make change, change for good. And, uh, you know, with lots of young people running around the Commonwealth, that's where we're going to spend most of our time, hopefully. And it was really one of the first things we connected on. It was one of the yeah. first things we started talking about when we met was just the different things that we wanted to do in the world and how passionate we were about seeing change, I think. For anyone obsessed with the next royal romance, the conjecture ended in October 2016, when news of Prince Harry and American actress Meghan Markle's relationship broke. I received probably 15 emails and tweets kind of all at once when the news broke. Instead of the excitement dissipating, the buzz of this unexpected romance broke records. And we found out that she was a little bit older than him. She um, you know, obviously was a famous actress in her own right. And I immediately started Googling her and was like, okay, you know, this girl, she's beautiful, she's smart, so it definitely was exciting and intriguing. Megan was the most Googled woman in 2017. It's what the public wanted. It was a love story, it was exciting. When the beans spilled that they met through a mutual friend, who this royal matchmaker was became the hottest mystery in social media. There have been many hints, but no one has confirmed or denied Cupid's identity yet. We were introduced actually by a mutual friend who um, we will... We should protect her privacy protect and not her privacy, reveal yeah. too much of that. And, um, but it was, it was literally, it was through her and then we met once and then twice back to back, two dates in London mm -hmm. um, last July. With the story of how they met put to bed, a new obsession took over royal fans. Is Meghan Markle actually the one? It was, I think, about three, maybe four weeks later that I managed to <laughs> persuade her to come and join me in Botswana. Right off the bat, he took Meghan with him to Botswana to celebrate her birthday and experience his glamping. Then, in 2016, it became apparent that this relationship was significant. According to Royal Watchers, when Harry took Meghan to his best friend's wedding in Jamaica, gossip turned into a genuine buzz. The three-day Jamaican celebration was the best opportunity yet for Harry to introduce Meghan to his inner circle of friends. And it was reported that they fell in love with her too. The romantic occasion provided the perfect opportunity for the pair to show their affection for one another. We had a good five, six months almost mm -hmm. with just privacy, which was amazing. Very early on when we realized we were going to commit to each other, and we knew we had to invest the time and the energy and whatever it took to make that happen. I don't think you've had any idea what time zone you've been on for the last year and a half. 
No. <laughs> coming over here four days or a week and then going back and then straight into filming the next day, 4 a.m. wake up calls on a Monday, yes. straight into set. The media broke into a frenzy when word got out that the couple would be making their first public appearance together at the 2017 Invictus Games. A major sporting event for wounded veterans initiated in 2014 by Prince Harry. One week ago, I told you that you needed to be ready, but even I could not have been ready for the scale of what we witnessed at these games. The Invictus Games are a personal and important event for him. So when Harry invited Meghan's mother, Doria Radlin, to join them at the closing ceremony, it was clear that this romance is the real deal and that Harry had Doria's blessing. It's just how differently they're doing things and you know, whether it's that sort of very unusual show of affection at the Invictus Games, you know, where Harry kissed Meghan not just in front of his future mother-in-law, but in front of the world. The speculation changed course. Now everyone wanted to know when and how a proposal would occur. But importantly, was Meghan going to be accepted by the royal family? And was the Queen going to permit such a union? I think the Queen's definitely excited about this. I think if anything, she's just more excited about the fact that Harry's finally going to now be off the market. I think there's no reason to think the Queen wouldn't be anything other than delighted about this marriage. She's a devoted grandmother. She played a critical role in Harry's life as a young man after Diana's death. Let's be honest, she's in her 90s. So she wants to make sure that everything is right before she goes. And I think she's doing it really well. She's become much more progressive. She's become much more relatable. She has allowed things that potentially might not have been allowed before to happen. She understands too that if the royal family is gonna carry on, that we need to see them being modernized. We need to feel that we can actually be a part of their lives. Meghan had already met Prince Harry's father, Prince Charles, and his wife, Camilla. She was now good friends with Prince William and Catherine, Duchess of Cambridge. You know, I've been seeing her for a, for a period of time where I literally didn't, didn't, didn't tell anybody at all. And then William was longing to meet her, and so was Catherine. So, you know, they're being our neighbors, we managed to get, get that in a couple of, well, quite a few times now. Um, and Catherine's been absolutely um, amazing, as is William as well, he's, you know, fantastic support. And then my, my father as well, we had a, you know, a couple of, no more than that. We had a handful of teas and meetings and... We've just had a really nice time getting to know them and progressively helping me feel a part of, of not just the mm -hmm. institution, but also part of the family, which has been really, um, really special. The breasts were held at the prospect of meeting the Queen. We didn't have to wait long. When Harry whisked Meghan away on a birthday holiday to Botswana, the couple returned and made a beeline for Balmoral. The consensus is that it was at this summer residence of the Queen that Prince Harry was able to make a formal introduction to the 91-year-old monarch. It's incredible, A, to be able to meet her through his lens, not just with his honor and respect for her as the monarch, but the love that he has for her as his grandmother. All of those layers have been so important for me so that when I met her, I had such a deep understanding and, of course, incredible respect for being able to have that time with her. And, and we've had a really, she's, she's an incredible woman. As the couple's relationship blossomed, sweeping changes were coming for Miss Markle and her seven-year stint playing Rachel Zane, the feisty paralegal in the hit show, Suits. The show's creator, Aaron Korsh, and his writers carefully planned for what they saw as inevitable. They gradually wrote Rachel Zane out of the series. It's a new chapter, right? And, and also keep in mind, I, I've been working on my show for seven years. Um, so we were very, very fortunate to be able to have that sort of longevity on a series. And for me, once we hit the 100 episode marker, I thought, you know what, I have, I have ticked this box and I feel really proud of the work I've done there. And now it's time to, as you said, work, work as a team mm. with, with mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. yeah. The anticipation of an engagement continued to build. And finally, a formal announcement by Clarence House was made. Meghan Markle would become a member of the British royal family. And tell us, how did you propose? 
Was it romantic? The occasion itself will generate global television audiences, news items. Already they're planning it. We're already, what, five months away. It is not lost us that a significant person is missing from this happy event. I spoke to um, a veteran royal reporter who spent years photographing Diana, who took the very first pictures of Meghan and Harry kissing at the polo last May. He said he hadn't taken pictures like that of the royals since Diana. Diana, Harry's mother, has striking similarities with Meghan Markle, and Harry thinks they would have been great pals. She would be over the moon, jumping up and down, you know, so excited for, for me. But then, as I said, it would have probably been best friends, best friends with Megan's. Diana would have liked the way that, that Harry had grown up. I mean, obviously, you know, it, he was in his early teens when, sadly, his mother died in that tragic accident in Paris. But, you know, he, he, he survived that. He, as a young lad, walked behind his mother's coffin, you know, in front of the sort of world's media. And he talks about it openly now. Uh, and so in that sense, you know, his mother would have been exceptionally proud of him. Well, I think Diana would be thrilled to see William and Harry settle down with, you know, two really perfect brides, actually. Kate is, is so perfect um, for the role that she has to fulfil. And I think Meghan's, you know, going to be a great success at all. She's already proved to be very suitable in so many ways. They make the princes happy, and I think that's that's probably more important to Diana than, than anything else. She said she wanted them to marry for love. And... Diana was a very hands-on individual. So it, in that sense, would have been delighted with the way that William had found his, his love, his wife at, at university. And in the same way that no pressure was put on Harry to find his life. Obviously not being able to meet his mom, it's so important to me to, to know that she's a part of this with us and, and I think in being able to meet just different people who are so important to his mom, I'm able to in some way know a part of her through them and of course through him. But Prince Harry found a way to ensure that a part of Diana will always be present and designed a ring that used two of his mother's diamonds with his own from Botswana. The ring is a beautiful legacy both to their union and Diana. The ring is, is obviously yellow gold because that's what I'm her favourite. And the main stone itself um, I source from Botswana. And the, uh, the little diamonds either side are from my mother's jewellery collection to make sure that she's with us on this, on this crazy journey together. Mm. Um, and It's beautiful and he designed it. It's incredible. Meghan Markle has a special kind of sparkle. Her bright smile and demeanor have that Hollywood glamour. Her warmth and genuine openness will win over the British. You can't fake that. This is the most important thing in my view that's happened to the royal family for, for centuries. I think Meghan Markle is the best thing to happen to the monarchy in years. She's young, she understands the zeitgeist, she understands what people want, and she really connects with people in a way that we also saw with Princess Diana. And so I think that it's, it's only a good thing that we have Meghan in there. She's sort of shaking off the cobwebs and moving the royal family firmly into the 21st century. There's no denying that Meghan Markle's elegant fashion style turns heads wherever she goes. Even before her engagement to Prince Harry, Meghan's stylish appearance grabbed the attention of the fashion world. Since news broke of her relationship with Prince Harry, Meghan has continued to wear her favorite labels, Mother, Erdem, Line, and Misha Nunu, to name a few. When they first made their public appearance announcing that they were engaged, she had on a white trench coat that was made by a Canadian company called Line. She orders a lot of her clothes from there. It's sold out within the hour. In her interview with Harry, chatting through the engagement and how they met, she was wearing a dress from an Italian company. Same thing, sold it within an hour. Inherently, Markle has already shown that her love for fashion and attention-grabbing style can boost her humanitarian work just like her fiance's late mother, Diana. 
I love Megan. I think that it's amazing that she's very different from the British mold. I think that she's a breath of fresh air that's very necessary in the royal family. We've seen it with her in terms of how she dresses, how she wears pants to events, how she does her hair, you know, unlike, say, Kate Middleton or some of the other royals who always look very perfectly coiffed. Meghan's style is frequently compared to her future sister-in-law. Princess Kate is quintessentially English. You know, everything that she wore from when she was at university was very sort of twin set and pearls, very sort of Chelsea girl, that kind of feeling that it's very, you know, you know what you expect to read when you open up Horse and Hound or Tatler. But you never see her in sweatshirts or sweatpants and some Uggs. Whereas someone like Meghan has been brought up on Uggs and sweatpants because obviously she's been on set so many times. So she's gone from looking quite, um, you know, offset when you are quite so dowdy and you don't really care about everything to being on set where she's ultra glamorous and, you know, she's been at numerous award ceremonies and she's also somebody who's modeled for magazines and modeled in fashion spreads. With Kate, over the years, we've seen her come into her own. She's wearing these very expensive outfits. Whereas with Megan, we've seen her wear jeans. We've seen her wear ripped jeans. Um, we've seen her looking very sort of normal and accessible when going to high profile events, unlike Kate, who always looks very perfect. The Duchess of Cambridge is also famous for her classic, modern style. There are many similarities. Both have the ability to influence sales with the Kate effect and the Meghan sparkle. One thing that we've noticed with the style, first starting with Princess Diana and then Kate and now Meghan, is that all of these bits of clothing and these, you know, staple accessories and tops and dresses, they're so accessible, right? I mean, you can really quickly get online and find out where's that top from. There'll be a link to buy it right then and there. I definitely think that Megan, like Kate, has an effect when it comes to selling clothing. We've seen it when she wears something immediately. There are now style blogs devoted to Kate. There are now uh, Twitter accounts devoted to Megan. They've already made headlines at a joint event with their elegant style. Kate portrays something that people want. Megan portrays something that is much more approachable that people can get right away. Some were concerned that a rivalry could be in the works, but it seems the two will have a close relationship, much like another royal wifey pairing. I think it's impossible to not compare Kate and Meghan with Diana and Sarah. In the case of Diana, she was married to the heir, and then you have Sarah Ferguson. She's this breath of fresh air. You know, she's always in the news for doing sort of silly or dramatic things. She has a great sense of humor, and you really do see that compared Comparison between Kate and Megan, where Kate is a little more buttoned up, she has more restrictions, whereas Megan is kind of the playful one. She's the new, bright, young, shiny thing. We think Megan meshes her own, relaxed Californian fashion style beautifully with her new British role. And this is something uniquely hers. We also love that our fashion choices are diverse and inclusive, and touch on a desire to experience new trajectories. Meghan Markle wears a lot more ready-wear type of clothing. And so what you're going to have is fashion designers that are making ready-wear attire where they can go ahead and produce it quickly, sell it, and then as soon as that inventory sells out, Meghan Markle will go ahead and put her Markle spin on it again, and then it will start a whole new trend of clothing along that ready-to-wear business attire. Megan portrays something that people can get right away. And so it's something that people can find at their local department store, whether it's Nordstrom's or Macy's. Oh, <laughs> do I love Guilty the Guilty as charged. Yeah. Of course, especially with our hours, too. So it's easy. Yeah, right? It's like, if I have downtime in my trailer. Speaking of trying new things, Megan is a huge fan of wine. Her favorite, a Tinganello, led Megan to name her former blog, The Tig. The namesake is from a wine called Tignanello, but uh -huh. in the States we sort of bastardize the name and say Tignanello. <laughs> and it was my first sip of wine where I said, oh my gosh, Whoa. what is this? Like, <laughs> to, I said to the bartender, what am I drinking? He's like, just call it the Tig. This moment revealed to Megan that to live is to be curious and insatiable in living one's life. From then on, all aha moments became a Tig moment for Megan. Go someone had 
always asked me about fans, especially once the show started, mm -hmm. travel advice or food, restaurant advice, fashion, of course. And I said, let me create a hub where I can have all of that stuff there that's really aspirational but attainable. Megan has remarked that the best part of discovering great wine is the adventure taken to find it, meeting the winemakers. However, Tignanillo is not her only favorite, anything red, as she calls it, opening the door for the popular Central Coast Pinot Noir as well. So Megan being from California, I can see her bringing Harry on an adventure up here through the Central Coast. Winding roads, it's beautiful scenery. So I can see them coming, kind of finding the different spots that they like. Pinot Noir is a varietal and it is one of those scrapes that is very engaging and captures your. It's not surprising, that's one of her favorite ones. And cool climate Pinot Noirs tend to just be so beautiful. They have such pretty notes and cherries, cherry blossoms, some hints of raspberry, some red currants. It would definitely be something that I see Megan and Prince Harry enjoying together. Megan is also a self-proclaimed foodie. Her philosophies on food and eating have the potential to become an incredibly positive influence on young people. Megan advocates lifestyle eating over dieting and is open about her years of teenage angst about weight and beauty. We love that she's such a fantastic role model, but is also not afraid to burst out the treats now and then. Markle's instinctive humanitarian side led to her adoption of Bogart and Guy, her two canine companions. I have two dogs that I've had for quite a long time, both uh, my rescue pups, and one is now staying with very close friends, and my other little guy is, yes, he's in the UK. He's been here for a while. Okay. They say that dogs have the innate ability to judge good and bad, and even the royal corgis, usually the toughest audience of all, according to Prince Harry, have embraced Meghan into the royal family. For the last 33 years being barked at, this one walks in absolutely nothing. Just laying on just my feet during tea it was very sweet. Was like, oh. That definitely scored a few points with the queen. Boom. However, it hasn't all been smooth sailing for royal romances. Many eyebrows were raised when it was revealed that Meghan Markle was not only American, but a divorcee. This royal union is a case of love comes first, as it was with King Edward, whose actions may have helped pave the way for this love story to unfold. The inevitable comparison between Meghan and Wallace Simpson has of course been made in the press because Meghan Markle will become the first American divorcee to marry into the royal family in 80 years. Fact, times have changed. Of course, for some people, you know, that immediately creates parallels because they think of the last time um, an American wanted to marry into the royal family, which of course was Wallace Simpson. And people draw parallels and say, oh, but isn't it amazing how far we've moved on? And actually, I mean, yes, we have, but Edward VIII was king at the time that he wanted to marry Wallace Simpson. His Royal Highness King Edward VIII's marriage to American divorcee Wallace Simpson in 1937 is one of the most significant romantic scandals in British history. So great was the monarch's love for Wallace Simpson that Edward abdicated the throne to marry her. Edward was uh, direct in line to the throne. He gave up his throne because he wasn't prepared to be king without, as he put it, the help and support of the woman he loved. So he abdicated and they went off to Paris and got married and never lived happily ever after from then on. There are striking similarities between King Edward VIII's marriage to Wallace Simpson and Harry's pending nuptials to Meghan Markle. Wallace was American, as is Markle. But there are interesting distinctions too. Harry is fifth, soon to be sixth in line to the throne. So it's far less significant the fact that he's marrying um, an American actress, a mixed race actress, a woman who's 36 and been married before. Meghan is a very different person. She's been married before, she's a divorcee. Charles was married before, Camilla was married before, both divorced, they got married. For Edward and Wallace, marriage to a two-time divorcee was at the time immoral, and with World War II looming, the British people needed a strong monarch. Harry, unlike his predecessor, Edward, um, is not heir to the throne. He's not king. And in fact, because there are now several heirs with William, he never will be king. When Edward wanted to marry Wallace Simpson, it was literally a constitutional crisis. It was, you know, absolutely 
unfathomable to the people. In terms of Harry wanting to marry Meghan, you know, he's fifth or sixth in line for the throne. He's way down the line. Um, there isn't really the worry that we'll have an American queen on the throne. So I think that Harry has a lot of flexibility and freedom in being able to marry for love instead of having to have an eye toward duty. A lot of comparisons have been, you know, floated about Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson. Well, of course, that was in the 1930s, 1936. We're looking at a totally different royal family then. You know, this was a, a non-starter. But then, you know, Wallace Simpson was a divorcee, and there was some interesting history around that time. But the royal family have progressed, you know, following his abdication. The responsibility of the monarch was to the Church of England, and the church had no time for a divorcee as future queen. It was a stigma. You talked about it in hushed terms. If somebody was divorced, you thought, oh, no, I'm not terribly sure I can socialize with that person. It's no longer a stigma. It's a fact of life. You know, people get married. They don't like each other anymore. They get divorced. You know, we've moved a long way from the days in the 1930s when divorce was frowned upon by the Church of England. Britain's royal past is intimately bound with religion. Even Meghan Markle in 21st century Britain was baptized before her wedding day. But no other union rocked a nation to its spiritual core than that of King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn in the 1500s. King Henry, already married to Queen Catherine of Aragorn, decided Anne would be his and plotted to have his marriage to Queen Catherine made void. Rebelling against the Pope's intense opposition, King Henry married Boleyn in a secret ceremony. This marriage changed the religious culture of England forever. The Church of England came under the stewardship of the monarchy, and Roman Catholicism lost its footing. And Anne Boleyn, of course, was uh, ultimately charged with adultery, um, incest, and witchcraft, and then burnt. Uh, or had a head chopped off rather. Since the ill-fated marriage of Anne Boleyn and King Henry, times have changed, and one need look no further than Prince Harry's very own brother, Prince William's modern-day romance with his college sweetheart, Kate Middleton. In fact, Harry could be thanking his older brother, William, for laying the foundation for a modern-day royal union. It was actually Diana who told William and Harry to marry for love. You know, when they married, it should be for love. And I think that that's exactly what they've done. It's, it's, certainly, it's certainly what William's done and it's, and it's what Harry is doing too. William and Harry have learned from the past royal wedding. They saw their mum unhappy in her wedding and they didn't want that for themselves. I think that they've realized that they can be happy and it's up to them to make themselves happy. And I think actually Queen Elizabeth has, has recognized that also, and that's why she's been so understanding. You have to look at the choices that William and Harry have made and the women that they are, are with. Kate, a commoner, not of blue blood, not perhaps the aristocrat that we might have picked for Prince William, but that marriage, and that relationship is and has been, you know, hugely successful for 10 years. Now England's beloved Catherine, Duchess of Cambridge, the paparazzi incessantly reported on Kate's lineage of coal miners, blue collar workers, and the lack of any aristocracy. From what I've seen of Meghan so far, if you were going to compare her to anyone, I wouldn't be comparing her to Kate because I think they're two very different women. Yes, they're the same age. Yes, they've fallen in love with princes, but actually that's where the similarities end. The American press is bound and determined to sort of pit Kate against Meghan, um, but the fact is they're very different people. Meghan marries into the royal family, a famous actress in her own right a divorcee, she's got history, you know, there's a whole background to her, whereas, you know, Kate married in, I almost say a blank canvas, you know, her longest term relationship of 10 years was with Prince William, she didn't have a full-time job as such. Kate is a mother, soon to be mother of three, um, I think that Kate has had an extraordinary burden being the only sort of young, visible royal in the spotlight. And now that Megan is coming into the picture, there's room for Kate to kind of take a step back, um, hopefully to breathe a little. We are delighted that Meghan Markle's fairy tale romance is a reflection of how far royal traditions have evolved. And we can't wait to see her sparkle on her wedding day. Once the Cambridge's third baby arrives, Harry will move down the order of a succession and he will become sixth in line to the throne. and. 
Because of that, it's incredibly unlikely that he is going to be king. So he has a very different role from William. So I think Meghan and Harry will be a different couple to William and Kate. They have different roles, different purposes. Nonetheless, both are meaningful. You know, Harry and Meghan have that freedom, I think, um, to perhaps push royal boundaries a little bit more than William and Kate would be able to do. In a monarchy, where the very queen herself, in her 93rd year, her husband, 96, you know, yeah, they have a great longevity, but no one lives forever. So in the next decade, there are gonna be huge changes, and Meghan and Harry will be front runners in that change, whether they go second to William, who might become king, or whether his father decides he doesn't wanna be king, or whether the Americans get fed up with community. I don't know, there are so many different options open at the moment that this, this this sort of new group of royalty of which Meghan is now part of is going to be instrumental in the changes that lie ahead. This engagement is definitely a sign of modernisation in the royal family. It's really shown them to be progressive. It's shown the Queen actually thinking, OK, I want my grandchildren to be happy. This is about happiness rather than protocol. It's, it's just a very different time for the monarchy and William and Harry are unwilling to let these sort of old grey men at the palace tell them what to do. Princess Diana wanted William and Harry to grow up as normal boys. Well, normal boys will, you know, travel the world in, in the early 2000s and go to Vegas and, and be in Canada and meet women from around the world. With Meghan going to the royal family, it helps out the royals become a lot more approachable to not just the British, but the Americans. And so it makes, it almost makes the royals one of us, a little bit closer to becoming one of us. After the excitement of the engagement announcement, the wedding day promises to deliver the stuff that fairy tales are made of. This is a massive deal, and it'll have, it's not just the day, you know, it's a really big run up from everything. It's a massive marketing platform for the UK. This is much more than just a wedding, it's a cultural shift. Courtiers have said that they want their day to be one of joy and happiness and for the public to be as much a part of it as possible, and they will be. We know it's going to be televised. For Williams and Kate's wedding, all the royal pomp and circumstance was on display. Grand carriages, women in big hats, and a tiara for the princess to be. Harry and Meghan's big day will be equally as impressive. She's going to be seen by billions of people. The whole world is going to take a picture of her and watch her. So it's very important to make sure that you look perfect. So she will rehearse her look probably two or three times before she actually gets to the day before the wedding. You know, how life-changing is this? Well, it's a huge life-changer. Because suddenly, you know, one minute you're Meghan Markle, the actress, and whatever, going anywhere. Next thing, you're a princess for the realm of the United Kingdom. You know, you've got to think about her. She's going to be seen from every angle. It's 360 Meghan Markle, you know. It's not just one angle. Hi, oh, Meghan, how are you feeling? She has to think about everything. And that, what's great about her is having that TV background. She understands that. Having that red carpet, you know, readiness. She, she understands she has to look great from every angle. So having chosen a, quote, smaller venue, Windsor Castle, as opposed to Westminster Abbey, the amount of spectators and A-list guests will be out in droves. It's going to be very interesting because the royal wedding won't be in London, first of all. It's going to be in Windsor, which is a beautiful place. But I think what's going to be very interesting is, first of all, how, how, how are the massive, massive crowds going to be managed? Because that whole place is going to be full of so many tourists, so many people from London coming up and wanting to see or get a glimpse of the royal family. For Meghan, there has been a great deal of speculation as to the designer of her special wedding gown and who exactly is on her guest list. She is known to have quite the A-list of friends and work associates. I doubt whether she'll be wearing the dress that she wore in suits, but I do think she'll be. Uh, and I think, you know, also um, there's a lot of um, She's, you know, she's got to live up to 
what Princess Kate wore, you know, which is a, it was a most amazing dress by Sarah Burton, you know, fantastic. Uh, and again, even with Pippa Middleton, you know, that dress was talked about for years afterwards. So I think there's a lot of pressure on her. Um, and I think also she has to look traditionally English, but also, as we've just said, she's American. So uh, American style is a little bit different from the UK style, so I suspect there'll be a bit of a fusion between the two, and hopefully the crew will be happy. She'll probably tear a page out of Kate's book, actually. Uh, lace is still very much in, and she's simple. It's a May wedding, so spring, but I don't think she'll get away with being too revealing. I think she'll probably still go for something long-sleeved. The guest list, of course, is going to be much speculated upon in the, in the months leading up to the wedding. I'm, I'm told that the Queen has told the couple that they are to draw up the list of who they want to be there. It's going to be a smaller wedding than William and Kate's. They had 2,000 people at Westminster Abbey. Um, Meghan and Harry will have 800, which is still a sizable wedding. And of course, it's going to be fascinating to see who turns up. Meghan will bring that sort of injection of Hollywood. You know, I'm sure we will see some of her co-stars from Suits and, and actor friends from, you know, the years that she's worked in Hollywood. Of course, she's got very famous friends. She's close to Serena Williams. She's close to Boris Becker. Harry's got famous friends. Elton John is, is incredibly close to Prince Harry. I suspect that Obama will be at the wedding, which will be quite interesting because he will be there and Trump won't be there. Harry and Meghan are also causing a few headaches for the Royal Guard. Expect to see a few detours from the traditional wedding do's and don'ts. The rumor on the street is that Meghan is going to be giving a speech at her own wedding, which is a big protocol no-no. Regardless of what it took to arrive at this point in Harry and Meghan's relationship, one thing is for certain, that on May 19th, 2018, a Disney fairy tale will come to life as a prince turns a lovely young lady into a real-life princess.